Hey there, I'm Brittany Luce, and you're listening to It's Been a Minute from NPR, a show about what's happening in our culture and why it doesn't happen by accident. I want to start today by saying how horrified I've been over the past two weeks, seeing images, watching videos, and reading about the escalating violence between Israel and Hamas. It is nothing short of heartbreaking. I've also been horrified by how quickly reports of the violence have been hampered by misinformation and social media noise. And frankly, I'm at my limit. This conflict is the first major test of Elon Musk's X when it comes to spreading verified information, and it's failing hard. Twitter was once a place where you and I could turn for real-time, on-the-ground information from journalists. Instead, I've seen footage from a video game being passed around with people claiming it was from the conflict. That is mind-boggling. On top of that, celebrities and corporations alike are jumping on the moment to make statements and take stands, posting just moments after the news dropped. They're taking a deeply complex history and boiling it down to press statements on social media. And for what? Who is this for? I was perplexed when Justin Bieber, of all people, posted an image of a bombed out city with the words pray for Israel on top of it. He had reposted it from an account called Church Home, an account which clearly has no access to any geopolitical information. And I need to make very clear that this photo of the bombed out building is not from Israel. It was from Gaza. So I ask you, what good is that doing any of us? And that's where I want to focus today. How we got to this moment where platitudes and misinformation are as present as verified fact. I'm starting today with crisis public relations expert Molly McPherson. She's back And we're getting into why celebrities and corporations have entered the conversation and why this may be evidence of a broken culture. Molly McPherson, welcome back to It's Been a Minute. Oh, well, it has been a minute since we last spoke, but I'm so excited to talk with you again. (laughs) Yes, literally last week, albeit um, under different circumstances we were talking. Much. Much different. Much. So Molly, to start off, I was traveling when Hamas attacked Israel. But something that came across my social media was that the 76ers put out a statement condemning the attacks Mm -hmm. and standing with Israel. The Mm -hmm. Philadelphia Mm -hmm. 76ers. Like that let me know, okay, we're, this isn't just celebrities that we're seeing. That was my first. That was your first, yeah. Introduction to this, Mm -hmm. to this entire crisis in the first place. I was bewildered. I was like, why does an NBA team all the way in Philadelphia feel the need to comment on an international crisis in general, but also hours after this has happened, you know? I, like you, Brittany, notice the same thing. We've certainly been at an age for a while now, particularly coming out of the pandemic and certainly with George Floyd. And Mm. George Floyd was that moment where businesses, corporations, you know, entities learned that silence said something. Hmm. If we don't say something, then we're going to be clobbered. The silence in June 2020 Mm. I think people felt the repercussions of that and they're changing Mm. it. You know, there was a saying that was going around at that time, silence equals violence. If you're saying nothing, Mm -hmm. then the public knows what side Mm -hmm. you stand on. And I remember all of the different statements, even Architectural Digest put out an official statement condemning racism. I mean, it was well written. Whoever wrote it, you did a great Mm -hmm. job writing it. But, you know, as a Black person, I was like... I mean, this is nice. But Wait, so I as a black person, when Architectural Digest did say something to you that felt inauthentic? Well, it wasn't inauthentic. Like I said, I even went back and looked at the statement because it's one that stuck out in my mind for the past Interesting. Years. But I also know that Architectural Digest is a part of Condé Nast. And Condé Nast has been in the press multiple times over the past 10 to 15 years for having internal... HR issues with workplace racism (laughs) and workplace equity. And so that was like, you know, I'm like, oh, this is a nice statement, but I... Were you wondering the motive, the motive behind it? Yes, I was wondering, I was wondering the motive. And also it felt different to me because granted I was much younger when September 11th happened in 2001. I just started high school Mm -hmm. and I wasn't exactly examining different companies' corporate responses to that moment. But... Even when I just went looking for things like that, I don't know. I don't remember that being a, a big deal. Yeah. Like, 
But in the immediate aftermath, all I remember is that a lot of television, it was all news broadcasts. And I don't remember anybody thinking, you know, what do the Knicks have to say about this? No. And there's a reason for that. We were in the landscape of television and newspaper and cable television being the dominant mediums and, you know, and radio, of course we did not have social media. So if someone wanted to make a statement, they would have to release a statement or a press release and it would have to be picked up. (laughs) So, and back then the communication of it was more from the news aspect because Mm. cable news and television news just received, I mean, so many viewers at that time. Right. So it was more about what happened and what you are doing to show patriotism or cause. And that's when we had, you know, all the celebrities came out and they had the 9-11 telethon. And that's where we were back then. But social media now has given us these forced platforms. Like now we have- Forced platforms. Right? Like everybody has a place now where they can chime in. So it's noticeable when people do or do not. Hmm. Hmm. You know, something I've been thinking a lot about is- is, is what's beneath all of this, as we've seen <laughs> great question. companies, corporations, organizations, and celebrities who really think the world, the person the, the, the world needs to hear from right now is me. And that's <laughs> obviously not the case, right? But yeah. I've also seen calls from the public about that. I remember a part of that in 2020, I mean, in, in, in June 2020, I was a person who was like, I don't know if I need to hear from... I don't know, like Gushers fruit chews about um, (laughs) racism right now. I don't know if fruit Mm -hmm. roll-ups has the answer. But there were some people who were, you know, tagging their favorite brands on social media to get their stance. Mm -hmm. All of that to say, I do think that there's something kind of sinister happening here. I think that people want to attach leader-like or friend-like qualities to some of these companies that they love. Mm -hmm. And I think that these companies are complicit in this too because – I've noticed this trend in in branding and marketing where it seems like companies are trying to almost anthropomorphize themselves or their brands. I'm thinking about the sassy social media accounts from um, Wendy's or Mm -hmm. Netflix. They have these chatty, personalized voices. So it doesn't surprise me almost to a certain degree that in a major cultural moment, some consumers are like, you know, Starbucks, you're my friend. (laughs) You're with me every morning. What do you think about this? I mean- even though I can see how that groundwork has been laid, it's still really wild. It is. And you're absolutely right. I mean, the word that I use is relatability. Hmm. Everyone, even a brand wants to be relatable. And when there's relatability there, there's a communication, there's a chemistry. And you're absolutely right. If I'm going to Starbucks every morning, they're my friend. Okay, hmm. They're on my app. They're my friend. They're in my hand. And so the risk too is I think some people worry, oh, they're going to come out and say something and then it's going to ruin this friendship. Hmm. And now I have to make a decision because you've said that. And this is where people are more cautious nowadays, which I think is wise. But for a business to take a stand on one side, because no matter where you fall in terms of the conflict with Israel or Hamas, you can still all agree on the sanctity of humanity. Hmm. And and that's why this is a case where if I don't see someone chime in, I'm fine with that. Hmm. But you had talked about the the sinister aspect to it. Yeah. I want to bring a I want to bring a case study into it. Okay. That is similar somewhat because it involves a natural disaster. You know, something where all eyes went to one place in the country. And everyone had concern. And that was the Maui wildfires. Yes. And because we were hearing about people who were blocked in and they're in the water and the destruction. Right. And then we had to hear from, we had to hear from Oprah and we had to hear from The Rock. Right. Did we need to hear from Oprah and The Rock? And when you had talked about the, the, is there something sinister behind it? I mean, I jumped on that immediately and said, well, we all know that Oprah has received a lot of grief about being a landowner in Maui. In Hawaii, yeah. And so yeah. when she kind of showed up, you know, on an interview and she was in a, you know, in a shelter helping people, they call that poverty porn, you know, and hmm. we, when celebrities come in and do that. Yeah. And then we found out about their, their fundraiser after that, you know, their people's fund, which they received so much backlash for again. 
People are paying attention. There is no doubt, but it has to come from a genuine place. It's been hard for me over the past couple of weeks to see all of the violence that has unfolded. And the question that I have for you in thinking about all of that, what is broken in our culture if, if while people are literally dying in a crisis on the other side of the planet, we're spending our time, and I mean, I'm not saying me, I'm not saying you necessarily, but the public is spending their time knocking on celebrities' doors, demanding for them to tell us what they think about those deaths. I mean, we are firmly in the age of the official response. You know, so whether it's the official corporate response, the celebrity response, people, I think, saw so much you know, blowback for people who either, were, you know, again, were silent during you know, 2020 or they said the wrong thing. And then we get into hmm. the pandemic and we remember the Imagine video with celebrities. Oh my god! I mean, cringe. cringe. And so celebrities don't want to do that either, right? So it's almost like with every new issue comes a new risk to being the face of the bad response. Hmm. But I do believe this one is different because I am paying attention. I feel like now this political issue is allowing people to go back into the corners, you know, and Mm. back into the darkness a little where they don't feel this need to have to like weigh in on it because it is, uh, it's a situation that is also getting worse. You know, it's not Mm. as if we know how it's going to end. It's going to get worse. But it still feels like there's like an ecosystem. Even over the past week, I've seen people tweeting at Taylor Swift to try to find out where she stands. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you got the public wanting to hear as much from Taylor Swift as they want to hear from Joe Biden. And that feels very scary to me. I mean, I can understand in some regards if there are some people who are very cognizant of how and where they spend their money and what causes they choose to support. But I don't know if your average consumer (laughs) is always thinking about that. Yes, So, you know, you are mentioning that balance because now on the timeline, like what are the events that change communication systems? This is now the rise of TikTok. Mm. And TikTok is the platform of instant commentary. Hmm. You know, we were a Twitter generation for so many years. You know, that's different asking a celebrity, like, please post or retweet something. Now we're in an age of, lives and comments and 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 then even mm. you know Facebook and Instagram kind of morphed a little more into like TikTok. And so we were we now have these generations coming up with this expectation huh. of not only content but commentary. Because mm. that's what makes content move is sentiment. People are now like so wired into sentiment. It's Well, how do you feel? It's either one side or the other side. Like neutral doesn't really exist anymore. Hmm. So in a way, it's like people want to know like, okay, this is how I feel. And I need to know how you feel because you have access to it. You have your own platform. Let's hear it. And if they're not, then they're silent. Huh. How do we get out of this? How do we get off this oh, train? Oh, we're not getting out of it. Oh, no. Brittany, I mean, I think our, our just our level of expectation for commentary from everyone has just heightened to a level now where commentary is almost like news now for us, which is kind of scary. Yeah, scary. So the absence of it is what I think people uh, do notice. Hmm. Well, Molly, I am like, I'm hanging on. I'm hanging on. I'm hanging on just, too, Brittany. I'm hanging on because this is, this has been, it's been a devastating last two weeks. And, um, and the responses that I've seen from every corner of the internet and every corner of <laughs> society have been something really to unpack. Uh, and I, I'm very grateful that I got to talk about this with you because it has been on my mind. So thank you so much. Thank you. That was Molly McPherson. She's a crisis public relations expert and friend of this show. Now, throwing out commentary in a crisis, potentially to save face, is sinister in its own right. But I want to turn our attention to something I find even more worrying, the spread of misinformation. Coming up, why I believe this crisis has taken us into a new era of misinformation and why that breaks my heart. We'll be right back. Thank you. 
I started the show talking about how devastating it's been to see the images from the Israel-Hamas war. Reports from demolished hospitals, leveled buildings, and thousands of wounded civilians. I'm also horrified by the number of fake images, video, and reports that have been circulating wildly on Elon Musk's X. Twitter was once a site where we could go and get on-the-ground reports of what was happening in a crisis. Think back to the Arab Spring and how instrumental it was for that movement, or the Black Lives Matter protests. But fast forward to today, and Elon Musk is now in charge of the platform. And the changes he's made have clouded the public's ability to distinguish fact from fiction in an escalating crisis. I've got Shannon Bond here with me. She covers misinformation for NPR, and she's been tracking how this moment could be the beginning of a new era when it comes to misinformation. Shannon, welcome to It's Been a Minute. Thanks for having me, Brittany. Oh, my pleasure. I just feel like I have been, my eyes have been crossing just because of the sheer volume of misinformation that I have been coming across. It's been overwhelming. I know you have been following how misinformation has been spreading on X, formerly known as Twitter, and other social media platforms during this Israel-Hamas conflict. Can you share some of the examples you've seen across social media? Yeah. I mean, I think you are not alone in feeling like it's just a flood of this. We're seeing all kinds of things. We're seeing a lot of rumors, right, and unverified claims things like mischaracterized or misrepresented videos. So one really, Mm. you know, kind of common thing we've started to see in any conflict, and we're definitely seeing in this conflict, is people will take clips from video games. I saw a couple videos claiming they were, you know, Hamas militants shooting down helicopters. It's from a video game. Terrifying. There are videos that are real videos from conflicts, but they may not be from this conflict. And then there's just a lot of of stuff that's just being faked. There was a fabricated White House memo claiming the Biden administration was getting ready to give something like $8 billion in aid to Israel. And that was just like, you know, it's like a photoshopped image that then circulates. Yeah, I have seen so many wild things on X. Elon Musk has owned the social media company for almost a year now, and he's made a lot of changes to the platform. And I think one of the most dangerous changes was the removal of the verification process, which required people to submit a government-issued ID to verify their identity. And Elon Musk has de-verified those previously approved accounts, and now Any user willing to pay $8 a month can receive, quote unquote, verified status. Literally, anybody can make up who they are. This week, I saw a random account claiming to be an Al Jazeera journalist. This person was eventually found out to be some guy. And he was found out because he was commenting on photos of Sidney Sweeney (laughs) and (laughs) saying that he liked the way that she looked. Just wild stuff. Now, eventually, you know, this account was found out, as I mentioned, but you know, not before this person posing as an Al Jazeera journalist was able to spread misinformation about what was happening in Israel and Gaza. The stakes are really high with this. How dangerous is that? I think it is really dangerous. This is exactly what folks inside then Twitter, now X, and folks who had been fired from Twitter warned is what would happen when Elon Musk first, you know, floated this idea of getting rid of verification or getting rid of the previous Mm. form of verification. He didn't get rid of the blue checks. He just basically almost completely reversed the way they work. So now, as you said, you can pay for this subscription, this $8 a month, you get the blue check. And it's not just that you get the blue check. People who pay for those subscriptions, who are now quote-unquote verified, their Mm -hmm. posts get priority in Twitter's feeds. And now they are eligible for monetization. Twitter is sort of playing around with revenue sharing, where basically if if you reach certain levels of like view counts on your posts, you can actually get money from the company. And as you can imagine, this creates a whole set of incentives that is not really around sharing information that is true – It creates a scenario where at least, you know, some of these accounts we see, you know, they're going to share stuff they think is going to be engaging, right? That people are going to reply to, people are going to share themselves, people are going to look at, it's it's going to go viral, regardless of, of its relationship to the truth. In a breaking news situation, in a conflict situation like this, in a, at a moment when people are desperate for information and information mm-hmm. is hard to come by, right, or mm-hmm. accurate information is hard to come by, you end up with, they often call it an information void. And what kind of floods in there are people who are willing to just be like, I have an answer for you. Maybe it's true. Maybe it's not. And even credible sources will get it wrong, right, and have to correct themselves. But I think you identified exactly the difference. 
a responsible professional news outlet does have mechanisms, whether it's corrections, updates on stories, an ombudsman, right, some sort of public facing. Mm-hmm. There is accountability and there is sort of a sense where we can say, we reported this earlier. We've now received more information and we realized that was not correct. And like, here is the correct information. Yeah. I, I mean, Twitter being a place where you could get real time useful information from dependable sources, that's a huge part of its legacy from, you know, the Arab Spring all the way through the first years of the COVID pandemic. But now we're seeing it fall apart. This is the first major international crisis that has happened since Elon Musk took over. What are we losing in our culture without what Twitter, not X, but Twitter was? Or used to be. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're right. I mean, I, I hesitate to look back with rose-colored glasses on oh, old Twitter, absolutely. right? I mean, it, no. it's, many people jokingly <laughs> refer to it as a hell site right. for a reason. <laughs> right, well before Elon came along, right? But you're right. Yes. It was imperfect for sure, but it was an important place, right? There were some guardrails in place and there was, you know, in, in many cases sort of a, a you know, a well-intentioned effort to say, let's elevate the voices of epidemiologists during a pandemic. The place we're in now is that, like, anyone can claim to be now, like, my I don't know about you, my Twitter feed at the moment, my X feed, is full of people who are suddenly real experts, apparently, on, like, rockets and war and, you know, yes. the history of, of Israel and Palestinians. And, you know, I'm sure some of them do know what they're talking about, but it's really hard to tell the difference. One of the things that I've noticed that uh, I've become aware of as Elon Musk has had ownership of Twitter slash X is that there are different social media policies and different attitudes towards social media platforms in different countries than the United States. Last week, a top official from the EU, the European Union, warned social media companies like Twitter, Meta, and others that the spread of falsehoods and misinformation on their platforms could result in fines of up to 6% of the company's revenue. Sounds wild, but to a certain degree, I was shocked that other governments have those sorts of guidelines. That sort of like, I will fine you if if you don't get this under control attitude, that seems missing from American political discourse. If other governments have this, why don't we? It's true. I mean, Europe especially is very much in a different place when it comes to regulation and particularly regulation of the Internet and of social media. Mm -hmm. There was a new law passed that recently went into effect in the EU called the Digital Services Act. And part of it requires platforms to basically be more transparent. They have to give reports on, like, what kind of content they're taking down, what kind of action they're taking But also European countries, many European countries, including Germany, Mm -hmm. for example, have really strict anti-hate speech laws. They just they have laws that would never exist in the U.S. because of the First Amendment. I'm sure I don't tell anyone in this audience that this comes from like a long history. And, you know, here in the U.S., it feels like we're kind of moving in the opposite direction. We don't really have a good grasp on how we apply First Amendment jurisprudence to these social media platforms, right? Like, as you said, that that EU law, I mean, that has teeth, you know, 6% of, of revenue. Yeah, that hurts. You know, these are real fines that we're talking about. And so what's happening is those are essentially becoming the de facto global regulations for these companies. Hmm. And it's going to be interesting to see whether that does change our experience on them. It'll be really interesting to see how that applies to our experience as users in the United States. That is riveting. Oh, you told me something. Just I'm sorry. I'm just like, I'm blown by that. But all that makes me think about other changes that I've been seeing on X, aka Twitter. There's been this shift away from Twitter's previous content moderation policies. So before Elon Musk took over, the rule was to limit the visibility of posts that violated its policies, like hate speech and harassment. But there was also the option of removing certain offending posts entirely from the platform. But now with Musk's freedom of speech, not reach policy, X no longer removes that kind of harmful content, but instead just limits the visibility of those posts. But over the last two weeks, I have seen a wild amount of Islamophobia and anti-Semitism go seemingly unchecked by the platform in a way I have never experienced before. There have been so many Muslim and South Asian and Middle Eastern, North African users who have been ringing the bell about receiving Islamophobic attacks and tweets on Twitter for quite some time. So it's not like these things are necessarily new, but 
it feels like it's more rampant than ever before. Why was it so easy to dismantle this policy? I mean, that that is exactly what they did. They dismantled this policy. Outside researchers have documented like an increase in hate speech, an increase in, in anti-Semitic rhetoric, mm-hmm. anti-Muslim posts. And it's really troubling. Mm-hmm. But, you know, he you know, he has generally said, you know, he thinks things more things should be left up, that the, the platform had been too censorious. And they've really have said they've they're relying heavily on this product called Community Notes, which is basically like crowdsourced fact checking. Right. Uh, right. Which is an interesting idea. Yeah. Like and you see them sometimes. It is an right? interesting idea. I've seen it work at some point. Right. It feels like a a strange thing to be relying on right now. Right, right, exactly. So you, you know you get these little boxes below a post that say, you know, you know, users thought you would want more context about this. They can be effective, but there's been some reporting from both Wired and NBC about just sort of how the system is being really overwhelmed. Frankly, just the sheer volume, like I think it's a lot to turn over to users to take you know, to sort of take care of this problem, especially yeah, yeah. especially in this kind of context where actually what you do want are sort of you know fact checkers with some experience or yes. you know open source intelligence researchers who know what they're talking about when it comes to say right. geolocating or saying you know this is a real video or not. And then on top of that, you know there, there's been also just the cuts that Musk has made. We, as we all know, you know he's slashed the staff at Twitter dramatically, but that included a large number of the staff who worked on content and safety. And so even if a company says, you know, it is it is working to take down this illegal content, there are just fewer people there who are able to do that. It's been most extreme at that company, mm-hmm. but it is something that is happening kind of across these tech companies. Companies like YouTube and Meta are also in some cases backing off of their you know, previous policies they had that were meant to contain the spread of false information, particularly misleading claims about elections and public health. There's been a lot of political pressure on them to do so. And then even independent researchers who study the spread of information online, you know, that a lot of that research has come under threat from Republicans in Congress and from lawsuits targeting them. And it's creating this larger environment in which, again, it makes it very hard for us to see and understand what is happening in the world and to see and understand how that gets spread and filtered through the multiple lenses of social media. Hmm. You know, another major change is that X no longer displays headlines when you share a link within a post. You only see an image or with tiny text in the corner that says the website that that article comes from, but no other context as to what the article is actually about. Whereas before, you had headlines and also sometimes at least a few lines of like subhead description. Do you see this as a problem? I think it's a huge problem. People don't click through links, generally speaking. It creates this real opportunity, right, to misrepresent what is in that link. You're saying like, oh, hey, I saw this New York Times story that says X, Y, Z. Well, the story may not say that at all. When that title's not there, it puts the onus of describing or contextualizing the image on the account holder, on the person who's posting it, which seems like a ripe environment for misinformation as well. Yeah, I think it absolutely does. It's a real problem. Just hearing it plainly from you, how do you see the stakes of misinformation in this war? And what could they lead to? What's really happening is bad enough, frankly, right, on the ground Mm -hmm, that mm -hmm, we know mm -hmm. about. When things are misrepresented to make it seem even worse or when language is being used to dehumanize people, it potentially gives people sort of mental permission to cheer on violence. In worst cases, you worry that it gives people permission to engage in violence themselves. I mean, Mm -hmm. we had the story, this horrific story out of Chicago over the weekend. Yes. About the six-year-old boy. Yeah, who was murdered by by his landlord. landlord. I mean, I've been heartbroken over that for days. Yeah. And the reporting has been that the landlord had been listening to conservative media here in the U.S. that had been warning about this idea that there was going to be some sort of global day of jihad and that he was going to be under threat from Palestinians. You know, his tenants were Palestinian and he went and attacked them. Hmm. I mean, obviously, most people who are seeing this stuff are not going out and actually committing violence. Mm -hmm. But there is always the risk that somebody will. I think whether it's like leading to you know, directly leading individuals into violence or more broadly, it, you know, builds 
potential support for state actors to engage in war crimes, right? I mean, that's that's one of the big you know concerns. And if we're so consumed with fighting with each other online over what is reality, mm. I think it makes it very hard to sort of step back and have any perspective. Looking ahead on the home front, what are the stakes of this misinformation? Like, where does this leave us going into 2024? I mean, I'm very conscious about the work that I do reporting on this. We want to encourage people to, like, be skeptical and and think, you know, question the sources they're reading. But I worry a lot about what, what the message ultimately we're giving to people is you, you shouldn't trust anything you, you see. And that's that's really corrosive, right? <sighs> yeah. Particularly when it comes to politics in this country. You know, there's an assumption of ill will for the other side. Mm -hmm. And there's a sort of an assumption that you could only trust the information that reaffirms your priors. And that doesn't seem to me a very good way to go into our democratic process. Hmm. Hmm. <sighs> Sorry, it's not, a, not uplifting. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, that's why I wanted to have this conversation today, because this has been heavy on my mind. Shannon, thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming on and talking with me about this. Thanks for having me, Brittany. You had great questions. That was Shannon Bond, and she covers the spread of misinformation for NPR. Now, from me to you, I have been overwhelmed by all of the violence I've witnessed from afar over these past two weeks. But I've also been humbled by how little I really understood about something so important. There's over a century of history and millions of lives at stake. There's frankly no room for our ignorance. And the rampant misinformation we're seeing and all these knee-jerk corporate platitudes make me only want to be more intentional about getting to the heart of this history. I owe it to myself. I owe it to all of you. And I owe it to my fellow human beings on the other side of this planet we share. Coming up, we're turning our attention to the courtroom, where nearly 30 years after his death, a suspect is on trial for Tupac Shakur's murder. We'll be right back. I was still in elementary school when the murder investigation of rapper, actor, and cultural icon Tupac Shakur went cold. So I was kind of caught off guard when I saw that there'd recently been a major development in the case. Police have arrested a suspect in the 1996 murder of rapper Tupac Shakur. A suspect has finally been arrested in connection with Tupac's death. Dwayne Keith Davis, a.k.a. Keefe D, is accused of ordering the kill and was indicted on a murder charge in Las Vegas. Keefe D is the uncle of the alleged shooter Orlando Anderson. And Orlando Anderson was killed in an unrelated gun battle in 1998 in Compton. That's Joel Anderson, a Slate reporter and the host of the third season of the Slow Burn podcast, which covered the life and death of Tupac. I don't think that there will ever be any closure. One, because the actual gunman isn't even going on trial. Closure or not, a lot of people are paying attention to this trial because they love Tupac, never stopped loving him. And to more than a few of his fans, he's considered something of a god. And while I can certainly get down with some of his songs, I mean, this might be controversial for a died in the wool Biggie fan, but I love Hit Em Up. It's a good song. I also think it might still be worth looking a little closer at how exactly Tupac ended up on a pedestal. So today on the show, we're talking about the legacy of Tupac Shakur and what's kept it going strong for so long. Joel, welcome to It's Been a Minute. Hey, it has been a minute. Thanks for having me on, Brittany. Absolutely. My pleasure. We were going to talk about Tupac Shakur. We got to talk to you. But I, I wonder from you, how have you seen Tupac's memory last? He's not as instrumental to the cultural moment as he was in 1996. But you could argue that he's still one of the most famous rappers, even today. And there's a reason for that. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of us people, Gen Xers, elder millennials, so to speak, who revere and cherish that music. That was part of our childhood. And we're the people that are in control of media now in a lot of ways. But the other thing, too, is that Tupac's death really bolstered him in a way that I don't know that would have happened if he had managed to stay alive. Like he mm. is forever frozen as this really handsome, charismatic, revolutionary type of figure. We never got to see him have a punch. 
He never filed for bankruptcy. He never had kids. He never got an opportunity to be a goofy dad in a Disney movie. You know what I mean? Mm. He still is the prototype for what a lot of rappers would like to be. That's just because he's one of one. Hmm. You know, recently there have been huge developments in the still unsolved case of Tupac's death. Dwayne Keith Davis, a.k.a. Kefi D, was the first person arrested and indicted by a grand jury in connection to Shakur's murder. But in the lingering aftermath of his death, the prevailing narrative is that it was unsolved. And, you know, nobody could know. <laughs> there, nobody could have any clues mm-hmm. as to, you know, who might know something. How do you think that contributed to keeping Tupac in the public's mind? I mean, it's funny you mentioned that because, I mean, you were around when the Machiavelli tape came out in 96. Yeah, I was, the- I was, I was in the like second or third grade, but yes, I was. Around. Oh my God, I forgot you're a baby. <laughs> You're a baby. Okay, that's right. You're a baby. I keep forgetting. Uh, yeah, well, okay, so when the Machiavelli tape comes out in 96 after his death, like mm-hmm. there was this rumor, and I wished it like we had the internet or something, but all of us <laughs> swore we heard the before the first song, Tupac whispering, Shook Shock Me. Yes. Shook Shock Me. His murder seemed like an extended act to the final year of his career, when he mm. sort of openly courted death and seemed resigned to it. Even a few days before he gets shot in Vegas, he records the video for I Ain't Mad At You. It's about him dying and going to heaven. People thought that, oh, because Tupac is just such a great actor and because he's such a provocateur, a great performer, that this is all an act. This is all part of the whole thing. You know, this is what comes with Tupac. The idea that there was a murder or a death there made people think, oh, no, 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 no. The people that were close and engaged with that case Never bought into any of that stuff, but it was out there in the ether. Hmm. You brought up the notion of conspiracy theories around Tupac and his death. So many people have held for decades conspiracy theories around what happened to Tupac. I mean, one of the most prominent conspiracy theories is that he's still alive, Mm -hmm. you know, in Cuba with kids. One of my best friends swears that she has seen him (laughs) in the 2000s walking around Mount Vernon in New York. (laughs) There are a lot of dudes that look like Tupac. You know what I mean? <laughs> there really are. <laughs> but I mean, I wonder, like, what draws us to these conspiracy theories as fans, as Black people? And what do they do for us? The primary one that I always come back to is that it's better than the alternative that hmm. he died over some stupid young boy. <laughs> you know what I mean? That, like, hmm. he's 25 years old. At a casino, at the height of his career, you know, he has everything to risk. And he goes and punches a crip at a Las Vegas casino. Hmm. That is dumb, right? Yeah. That, that's crazy, right? But if we just say, what well, Tupac died because he inserted himself into a gang battle that he had no place in, then it really seems like a waste. It's hard not to feel like that guy was meant to do more special things. It's just easier to engage in the fantasy that maybe he didn't die in the first place. Hmm. There's a specific place in our culture for major hip hop stars whose lives are cut short by gun violence. I'm thinking about Biggie, Pop Smoke, Take Off. Mm-hmm. You know, Tupac was one of the biggest examples in my lifetime. I wonder, like, how has the response to Tupac's death affected the way that we have grieved other rappers that we've lost to gun violence? There was a time when we all sort of assumed that Pac's death was a wake-up call. Like, okay, like, we can't go too far. Like, we really need to get our arms around this. Stop the violence, increase the peace. Absolutely. That was the whole thing. Yeah. Absolutely, that movement. But mm-hmm. in a lot of ways, we've just come to expect that flirtation with death as part of the life cycle of a rapper. Hmm. Whereas at one point we thought, okay, this is outrageous. It's just like for a lot of rappers, you just kind of expect that they're going to have to deal with this. It really is unfortunate. I think about the economy that shoots up after, you know, some of these rappers pass away. How much of it is people trying to complete somebody's artistic vision? And how much of it is, I want to see if I can recreate Biggie and Tupac's posthumous 90s runs, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I remember when Jada Kiss said this in the 2000s. He said, you know dead rappers get better promotion. Yeah, yeah. Another thing that I think contributes to the deification of Tupac is his politics. His mother, Afeni Shakur, was an influential Black Panther, and she kind of shaped the politics that you hear in his music, You know, which for many, they see as being on the right side of history in many ways. And I think that that 
helps people not just hold him in high regard, but also almost like to a godlike level. Man, I mean, a dude had like critiques of capitalism. It's too much money here. I mean, nobody should be hitting Lotto for 36 million and we got people starving in the streets. Which is not something you hear very much from rappers. Yeah. Another thing that I think kind of gives him this godlike status is the release of all his posthumous works. A lot of guys I dated in college and nearly all of my friends from the West Coast, I'm talking even Denver, Denver on over, okay? They live and die by The Rose That Grew From Concrete, which is, you know, Tupac's famous published book of poetry. My producer, Corey Antonio, was even taught that book in what? sixth grade down in Florida. Yes. Wow. Yes. That's amazing. But that book was published in 1999. Yeah. Three years after Tupac died. And I can't think of many people other than him who released like seven albums after their death. <laughs> I mean, literally, like I only, I'm not even exaggerating, right? I mean, how have these posthumous works contributed to the mythology or deification and the conspiracy theorizing around Tupac's life and death? Tupac, before he became a rapper, he was a poet, a dancer, and an actor. Right. And it suggests a depth and an empathy, and a softness, and an intelligence, an awareness of the world that isn't necessarily evident in his later releases. It gives you an opportunity to see the depth of him, right? The beauty that he saw in the world, and also the struggle that he saw in the world. Mm -hmm. Like, Changes is like, kind of a, you know, that's a song you play at a graduation or something. You know what I mean? That's just the way it is. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm laughing because it's so accurate. But yes, you're absolutely right, yes. The more saccharine music and art suggests a depth and is accessible to at least men of my age in a way that maybe some of the harder stuff, like if you weren't trying to be a, a blood, that like maybe you can grasp onto that. But again, like I don't know how the female fans sort of grapple with that because, you know, there's wonder why I called you from the county and thanks to the welfare you were about to get your head done you got a dinner date can't be late Chicken you know all the other yeah. stuff that kind of yeah. came out and there's the you know the rape case right i'm actually glad you brought that up i mean tupac was what my producer Corey antonio called the gemini of gemini's oh i'm a and gemini that, what does that mean my husband's <laughs> a gemini so don't don't okay. get <laughs> all right I'll get that, i mean no offense I, okay all right also i'm a scorpio so i get slandered daily but Tupac had this kind of bifurcated personality to a certain mm, extent. Absolutely. Like he had this disruptive and shocking public persona. But, you know, many of his friends and, you know, people who knew him or close to him describe him as sweet, gentle, kind. The idea of, of Tupac as a sweet and tender person has really been kept alive by some of the women closest to him. You know, Jada Pinkett Smith, his late mother, Fanny Shakur. Kanata Jones, who was his girlfriend at the time of his death. I mean, even Keisha Cole and Maya Angelou have stories. But Tupac also has, you know, a complicated history with women. As you mentioned, he was convicted in 1994 of sexual abuse of a Black woman, which is a rarity, honestly, in this country. I kind of see Black women as pivotal to keeping Tupac's legacy as this, this sweet man or complex man alive. I wonder, like, do you see that? You're absolutely right that women have done a lot to contribute to his legacy. He did a lot of that work on his own, too. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, his first kind of big singles were Brenda's Got a Baby, which is yeah. about, you know, uh, a pregnant teenager who gives birth to a child and takes the fetus and puts it in the dumpster. I hear Brenda's got a baby, but Brenda's barely got a brain. A damn shame, the girl can hardly spell her name. And keep your head up which is also addressed to black women. Right. I give a holler to my sister's own welfare. Tupac kids, if don't nobody else care. And uh, I know they like to beat you down. Talk to anybody that even knew him for a little bit. They talk about how intense he was, how closely he would pay attention to you when he talked to you. He was very charming, and it was extremely easy to fall under his spell. Even when you get Jada Pinkett talking about his moods or his less honorable behavior, they talk yeah. about it in a sort of endearing way. It never becomes sort of a character assassination. And so I think that the women in his life sort of grapple with that too. They get to have those stories, right? Just like the woman who accused him of enabling rape. Him dying young ended a lot of questions or pushback to his elevation in the culture. 
we didn't have to grapple too much more with the coarse treatment of women in music, right? Hmm, we yeah. didn't we didn't have to deal with him emboldening some of the worst elements of rap machismo, like the name yeah. calling, the threats, claiming that he had slept with Biggie's wife, Faith Evans, right. you know, that sort of stuff. That's really ugly. Him dying young, we didn't have to grapple with any of that stuff that we would have had to if he gotten older. Right. I'm not sure that Tupac would have survived the Me Too movement of 2017. Also, as somebody that's sort of the heir to like the Black Panther legacy, let's not act like the Black Panthers were notable for like how well they treated women. Go look up Eldridge Cleaver. You know what I'm saying? Tupac never had to undergo that kind of scrutiny, which it's sad because nobody that talented that had that much to offer the world should die at the age of 25. Of course not. But also, like, it just freezes him in amber. Oh, absolutely. Freezes him in amber. But it also makes it easy for people to project yes. onto him whatever they might want him to think. So if you are like, I think that Tupac would have grown to follow Queen Afua and he would, you know, only be <laughs> drinking sea moss and wearing white, then that's what he's doing in your mind. If you Absolutely. like think that he would have become a womanist yep. and, you know, begun teaching Audre Lorde to, you know, the men <laughs> of the hip hop community, then that's what you think Tupac is doing in your head. Yes. <laughs> keeping on with this idea of who is keeping his legacy alive, Tupac is also sort of kept alive because people keep collaborating with him. There's mm. been the holograms <laughs> that have been resurrected to perform in 2012 at Coachella with Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg. And back in 2015, Kendrick Lamar included portions of a Tupac interview on the last track of his classic album, To Pimp a Butterfly. It was made to sound like they were in conversation. How would you say you managed to keep a level of sanity? By my faith in God, by my faith in the game, and by my faith in all good, all good things come to those that stay true. And it's kind of hard for a figure like Tupac to become a memory when people keep resurrecting yeah. his image and likeness. I wonder, what about artists who, who didn't know him? Mm -hmm. Why do you think they want to place themselves next to his legacy like that? I catch all the Tupac references in rap songs now. You know what I mean? <laughs> like they, they, yeah. they're, they're so much more alive to me. And I think what's happening here is that they're telling their fans and others that they've taken mm. the baton and taken rap to places that he would have been but never got to go. Mm. But when you claim the legacy of Tupac, you, you're telling people, I'm real and I'm about my people. All this money, all the trappings of fame, but at the mm. end of the day, I can and I will be for you. It's a tribute to, to a man that they revere. They're his sons and daughters uh, of, of hip hop today. And so when I think about it in that way, it's sort of comforting. Young folks don't care about elders, man. You know what I'm saying? Until they get older. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, sure. it's just sort of beautiful that in, in some ways to me that there's just so much reverence for him in the music. That's interesting. It's talking to my producer, Corey Antonio, and he was saying that like, you know, to a younger generation, like himself included, didn't actually know that Tupac was a very controversial public hmm. figure yeah. at the time of his death. Like only have known him since he's been this mythologized, like God-like figure. Mm -hmm. But it's still so interesting because his legacy has outlasted his life, that there are younger people who who don't have any memory of him being somebody who a lot of people didn't like. Man, that's really sobering. I never thought about it that way before. But hmm. yeah, you know, and I'm not making... A straight comparison, but maybe you'll fill me on this. Martin Luther King, he was seen as like a unifying figure, that there was not a lot of controversy around him. And then you go back and you look at the 1968 and you find out, oh, that he was actually very unpopular domestically. More Americans than not disliked him. And it's only in death that he was elevated in this way. And that people like, became, oh, you know, he, now he's the, don't believe in the, the color of your skin, but the content of your character guy. You know what I mean? Mm, yeah. And, and so in some ways, I think Tupac is sort of like that. And that like, because when, at the time of his death, people were terrified of him. They put him on the cover of magazines, you know, in all black or wearing chains. There was very much like, is Tupac a problem? And is he leading hip hop down a really dangerous place? Then he dies and a lot of that debate is over. And he becomes an elevated, sort of defanged, sanded down hip hop god. Hmm. Well, Joel, thank you so much for joining me today. 
I wouldn't call myself a Tupac fan. I might be Tupac curious to this day. <laughs> but I'm really glad that I got to unpack that with you. So thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me, Brittany. That's Joel Anderson, a Slate reporter and the host of the third season of the Slow Burn podcast, which covered the life and death of Tupac. This episode of It's Been a Minute was produced by Barton Girdwood, Alexis Williams, Liam McBain, Corey Antonio Rose. We have fact-checking help from Candice Bo Corkamp. Engineering support came from Trey Watson. This episode was edited by Jessica Plachek. Bilal Qureshi. Our executive producer is Verilyn Williams. Our VP of programming is Yolanda Sanguini. Our senior VP of programming is Anya Grundman. All right, that's our show for today. I'm Brittany Luce. See you next week for another episode of It's Been a Minute from NPR. 